This week on Vaticano, we follow Pope Francis on his trip to the Italian city of Bari for the ecumenical meeting for peace in the Middle East. Meet the newly appointed cardinal from Iraq, Raphael Sacco, the Patriarch of Babylon of the Chaldeans and learn how this designation can help Christians there. Learn about the story of the most famous image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in Rome with us. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis, along with the heads and representatives of Christian churches and communities of the Middle East, condemned the silence and indifference of the world in the face of the suffering of Christians in the Orient. On Saturday, 7th of July, the Holy Father hosted a day-long ecumenical reflection and prayer meeting in the Italian city of Bari. Our correspondent Andrea Gagliarducci participated in this meeting. We met Andrea to get a first-hand perspective on what happened. Well, the schedule was uh, very short but very intense at the same time. So the Pope came to the St. Nicholas Basilica, where the relics of St. Nicholas are buried. And down to the crypt, uh, there is a, an Orthodox chapel. It's the only Catholic church in the world that also has a, 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 an Orthodox chapel, where Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, have celebrations, have a liturgy every day. So it was a great, great sign of unity, and the Pope lighted the, the flame and is dedicated to unity. <laughs> then he went uh, on the sea, on the, in front of the sea, together with all the patriarchs, there were about 20 people over there. And there was a moment of prayer with all the people in public. Yet this region, so full of light, especially in recent years, has been covered by dark clouds of war, violence and destruction, instances of occupation and varieties of fundamentalism, forced migration and neglect. All this has taken place amid the complicit silence of many. The Middle East has become a land of people who leave their own lands behind. There is also the danger that the presence of our brothers and sisters in the faith will disappear, disfiguring the very face of the region. For a Middle East without Christians would not be the Middle East. Let there be peace. This is the cry of all those who are able today, a cry that rises up to God's throne. For their sake, we have no right in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world to say, I am my brother's keeper. Indifference kills, and we desire to lift up our voices in opposition to this murderous indifference. And then he came back to the basilica, where around the table was set, inside the basilica in front of the altar. And the Pope had a closed-door meeting with all the patriarchs on this table. And after this meeting, this uh, meeting in the front of the rock table, the Pope went out with all the patriarchs and he gave a declaration for the peace in the Middle East. So while the Pope was reading the declaration, people started shouting, unity, unity. And then the usual, uh, uh, the usual phrase, Viva, the, Viva il Papa, uh, hooray for the Pope, became Viva i Patriarchi, hooray for the Patriarchs. So the people got that it was an important moment of gathering and it was an important moment for the peace. And that was more important than any other word. It would be a mistake to think about this declaration on political issue. So, there will be other meetings, there is always a ecumenism of dialogue and a pragmatic ecumenism that is operated on the field. There perhaps will be other gathering led by the Pope, but this is not important, it's important the sign of unity. Because above that, above the official meetings, you know, there is this kind of ecumenism of blood that Pope Francis always talks about.
Christians are persecuted not because they're Orthodox or the Catholics or the Protestants are persecuted as Christians, so they work together as Christians beyond any theological division. Thanks for watching. Get ready to take a look at Holy See Diplomacy in action. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Early in June, here at the United Nations Geneva, the board of the UN Conference on Trade and Development organized a general debate and interactive dialogue. The Holy See contributed its Catholic faith-based perspective to both events. A decade after the global financial crisis of 2008, financialization or the growing influence of financial markets on the material well-being of most of humankind remains a core obstacle to progress, to reform, and to the promotion of integral human development. Doesn't the achievement, though, of integral human development start with the recognition and implementation of the uh, most basic human development, namely the right to life. Yeah, yeah. I would say certainly, you know, it is as it's a complex thing. I think the, one of the good thing of the United Nations, which are, I would say, often also criticized for having too many subjects, um, is that we are coming back to more and more essential questions, as a right to life, right to existence, right to education. Okay, the, the church does its best. But, you know, when we're talking about right to life in particular, if we look at the United Nations, um, the question of abortion. We, in the coming uh, anniversary of the uh, Char Charter of Declaration of Human Rights, we are going to present as a mission of the Holy See exactly considerations on this subject. Abortion, euthanasia, so many other things. It means if we, start, if we take human beings as autonomous, and independently f left in the hands of those who can decide about the future according to pragmatic th theories, we are in front of society that will be completely different. So it's always the same thing. You go to the weak, weak, weak. We have to stay with the weak. And this is the vocation of the church. And this is the vocation of the Pope Francis. Nothing else. How to do, we'll see. We do what we can. The UN Conference on Trade and Development was founded on the belief that developing countries needed more support and commitment by the international community to achieve inclusive and sustainable development. Mr. President, the expansion of international trade was understood not to be a goal in itself, but a means for ensuring stability and peace and to promote an inclusive human development. Why, in your opinion, uh, do not have all people equal opportunities for their human development. Let's say only one thing. In today's world, we all speak about the growth. But if everybody asks himself, well, how is growing your salary? Even in developed countries, salaries are not growing. So it means all this money is going just to, to one part of the society and the other has probably not enough participation. And we are talking now about the developed world, uh, the world that has no major problem. You can imagine what does it mean for the world that is underdeveloped and in big troubles. So we have to correct continuously the history, we have to correct the economy, and the church is one of the players, especially through its moral and ethical considerations. In your opinion, do Catholic business people apply their faith effectively in their business? There are two things which must be said. First thing is this general conviction of the church expressed through the teaching, through the documents of the Pope, which is somehow an appeal. And it appeals to everybody, certainly good for the Catholic more than the, the others, but also for the Catholics. But then, as you know, in the functioning of economics, the economic functions as it functions, and so it means everybody has to find the slot that it can correct and modify. So, so the change starts with yourself, and then it goes on. Then other, you know, this is the problem. No? If you don't change, then nobody changes. Mm -hmm. if you, and this is, the, everybody knows today, 
that we have to do this kind of new, I think the beauty of modern life, of being interconnected, of sharing and being encouraged by the others. According to the Holy See, in these troubled times, strengthening the role of the UN in trade and development to promote a more just global economy is essential. In June, here at the UN Geneva, the board of the UN Conference on Trade and Development hosted a debate and also a discussion about the Holy See's document about an ethical discernment regarding some aspects of the present economic financial system. This is part two of our report. For a long time, economic globalization has been dominated by the belief that free markets will be an unstoppable force in providing greater uh, riches for and fast harmonious integration of all peoples. Your Excellency, some 82% of money generated last year went to the richest 1% of the global population, while the poorest half saw no increase at all. Now, you have an insight into the UN's uh, brain, let's say, you know, more than, than we uh, outsiders. Do you think that the UN, through the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, is capable of transforming the world of economics? Um, we have to make at least one point, let's say, let's say one idea that could be, could be that egoism is not a good solution for the future. The problem of the United Nations that you can be added that it depends on the government. The United Nations is not an autonomous organization. It's an organization that acts in agreement or with, through the agreement of the governments. And this is, uh, so it means we are as good as the voters in every single country is good. If they don't vote the people who are going to behave differently, the United Nations cannot behave differently. It is our view in this, uh, the, in this purpose that we find uh, our way back to a global financial system that is again built on firm ethical principles and their daily application of justice, truth, fairness and solidarity. From your point of view, um, what does the church offer so we may find our way back to all of that? The church offers basically, you know, basically offers oh, perspective of the church, of the gospel. No? that, let's say, human life, well-being on the earth, is a part of everything. It's not everything, but only a part, a fraction of everything. It all starts with us. It must be so, you know. And I would say, but as a church, you know, not as me, you, but as church, let's say, because otherwise we are, again, irrelevant players. So many generous people are irrelevant because they have not a common project, you know. Mm. Society needs common project, and society appreciates common project, and also common projects have a real influence on the society. We believe in that. No area of human action can legitimately claim to be outside the guidance of ethical principles based on liberty, truth, justice, and solidarity. Now, in his speech at the United Nations in 2015, Pope Francis spoke against, I quote, every kind of abuse of usury, which is interest charging, by the financial industry, especially where developing countries are concerned, and that, I quote again, they are not subjected to oppressive lending systems, which far from promoting progress, subject people to mechanisms which generate greater poverty, exclusion and dependence, end quote. My question, in your view, are those who control the world monetary system are in denial of these ethical principles. We have to believe that everybody acts in goodwill, you know. The problem is that it is, uh, it is um, how to say, the competitive environment that makes everybody somehow more aggressive and less conscious about the other, other, ways, other people. In the Holy See's document that was discussed that day, we read that every one of us Catholics can do so much especially if one does not remain alone. We are just one of the players of many serious people today concerned about the future of the mankind. And I would say especially about how to have a vital, vibrant, developed society, but at the same time also, how to say, 
capable of sharing and sacrifice, give, sacrificially giving to the others. No? This is absolutely a need for any time, any environment, any place. The core message was that in front of the massiveness and pervasiveness of today's economic financial systems, the responsibility lies on the shoulders of those in charge of these systems. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. During the last consistory on June 28th, Pope Francis nominated Luis Rafael Sacco, Patriarch of Babylon of the Chaldeans, to be one of his closest collaborators, a cardinal. A few days prior to the consistory, we met his beatitude to learn how this appointment can change the situation of Christianity in the Middle East. Your beatitude, thank you so very much for joining us. And thank you for having me here thank with you. you. Chaldeans have a rich history in Iraq. You now become a prince of the church. What are your goals as cardinal for your country? As a patriarch, I am the head of a local church. But now with the universal church, it's something different. This is uh, giving me, you know, uh, more courage and more uh, space to move and to work, especially in the society, Iraqi society, but also in the, in the politics. Because I can really, I am doing that now, defending Christians, and they're protecting them, their rights, but now with, uh, the, you know, the impact uh, which the Vatican has, I will, uh, I am supported. Is there specific advice that you will give the Pope, for instance, in dealing with the persecution of Christians? I will uh, speak after the, uh, the consistory. Uh, thanking him, I will speak about the situation of Christians, not only, only in Iraq, but also in Syria, in Pakistan, in Egypt, you know, and uh, asking more uh, praises of the church, of universal church uh, in, uh, in these uh, countries, but also uh, to promote the dialogue, reconciliation among uh, you know, many coalitions, I mean political coalitions, but also to, to reform the constitutions. Because what we need is the citizenship, the, because there is no citizenship, it is sectarian. And Christians and, and others who are not Muslims, they are considered as a second category, and this is bad. So what we need is the the harmonic uh, coexistence and I think the only th the solution should be for everybody is citizenship there because from the beginning there, there is no project of citizenship for everybody. The, the constitution is uh, sectarian, you know, giving many rights to the Muslim because they are majority, the religion of the states in those countries is Islam. The others uh, come after them, and there are also legislations against them, discrimination, because uh, you know they don't have the same freedom, the same rights. And when we were uh, at Limina, the, visit, the official visit to the Vatican, we met the Pope on February 5th. We asked him for a meeting about all uh, Catholic and Orthodox patriarchs and he invited now, officially invited all the patriarchs to meet him in Bari on 7th of July. What are you hoping will come out of that meeting in Bari exactly? I think we, we should deal, discuss two things, the policy but also the freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. The policy should be a, a strong uh, you know, statement against the, the weapons and creating you know, wars only for their own interests, not for, you know, the interests of the population, local population. War is something bad, destructing infrastructure, killing people, and so. So, I think this is, this is a, a sin against humanity. 
You invited during that limb, and I believe you invited the Pope to come and visit your country. How much can we hope that that's going to happen and when? He told us, I am ready to come. And whenever they need me I, as a pastor, I, I, I like to go and to, to support them. But you know, the situation now is very complicated. And now we have, we have uh, had elections and we don't have the, new, the formation of a new government. We, we have to wait, maybe later, but not. Uh, I don't know how the situation is right now. Can you just walk me through how dangerous is it still? People imagine Iraq perhaps war zone. How much has changed? No, the situation has improved a lot now. We can walk. Uh, there, there are some attacks here and there, but very rare. You know? the, the life is normal, normal. And uh, I really I have to say that as Christians, we have also a lot of freedom. We can build churches without any problem not like in Egypt or in other countries. We can publish books, we can have televisions, radio, Christian radio or television, and we, we, we are free, you know, for our worship inside the church. I want you to tell me how the news was received in Iraq that you were soon to be made a cardinal. It was a feast, a big celebration uh, among Iraqis, because for them, this is really a, a, a sign of hope, but a big support internationally. And uh, many, many Muslims called me, or uh, during two weeks I was receiving people just to, to you know, for congratulation for that. And I hope I can do a lot for them. A cardinal is a sign of martyrdom. The red that you wear represents uh, the blood that you're willing to shed for the church. How do you see your new appointment in the light of the martyrs that your country has had? Well, before the Cardinal, a patriarch also has a, a red habit, just like the Cardinal. And our church, Chaldean Church, the Church of the East is a martyr church during the whole history. But even now we are giving martyrs. And I do hope uh, that the blood of the martyrs will be fertile, will be, bring us a future, bring us a new situation. For us Orientals, a patriarch, a cardinal, a pastor is not a prince. So we are there to serve people, not that just uh, people should serve us and to look for uh, prestige or privileges. No, we give up that. So we have to be faithful to that and to serve our people. Beatitude, thank you so very much. Shukran. Or <laughs> thank Abuna you so Luis, much. as you said, I should go. Thank you, you so you much. Very, very much. God bless you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Did you know the most famous image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is found in this church of Jesu, the mother church of the Jesuits throughout the world. The painting of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is inspired by the apparition of Jesus under the title of the Sacred Heart to Saint Margaret Mary Alacoc on the feast of the beloved Apostle John. The Lord Jesus came to Saint Margaret Mary while she was in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. The saint describes his sacred heart. Like a sun ablaze with a dazzling light, she recalls the divine heart was represented to me as upon a throne of fire and flames. The same church that houses the tomb of St. Ignatius Loyola, the great founder of the Jesuits, and the arm of the great missionary St. Francis Xavier. That arm baptized thousands into the Roman Catholic faith, as well as a cross, a miraculous cross, that dates to the 16th century. This famous image was painted by Pompeo Batoni in 1760. 
It was the very first devotional image and to this day remains the official image of the powerful devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Jesus asks Margaret to give him the gift of her small heart to be placed in the furnace of his divine heart. And then Jesus returns it to her, inflamed by his love. Margaret Mary did not invent devotion to the Sacred Heart, and she was not the first to experience an exchange of hearts. Many others did. Saint Catherine of Siena received the heart of Christ in place of her own. The promise of Jesus is revealed by the prophet Ezekiel. I will take away your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like yours.